So uh, um, and we've got Pete Grant and Bob Grant from Naperville. So without any further ado, I want to thank them for coming out and making the trip. They had to start at 5.30 this morning. Why faces for? Because every fatality on the roadway, due to the actions of somebody speeding, they are real people and real faces and real families that are affected by this. And to be quite honest with you, by the time we get done, I don't want you to ever forget my son's face. I want it to be embedded in the back of your brain that when you're out there and you're driving and you even think of doing something that you shouldn't, that his picture pops up and reminds you to make the right choice. The number four in Facebook four stands for our co-founder's grandson's age when his life was also taken by the act of somebody's feeding. Now once we came up with faces, we worked back to come up with the name. Families Against Chronic. Why chronic? Because in each case, the offenders that killed my son and our co-founders, daughter and grandson, they had multiple tickets, multiple supervisions, and still had a valid driver's license. Excessive, why excessive? But because in both cases, the drivers were going well above the speed limit. Now, give you guys a little bit of input on me. I want to hear from you. What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What are your goals? Anybody who has the courage to share what their dream is, where do you want to be in six years? Ten years. Takes a lot of guts to tell you to make a statement in front of your friends. Our son, you may be able to tell, his dream was to play football in college. Anybody? Come on, one person has to have the courage. Yes, ma'am. You want to play soccer in college? Are you pretty good? The uh, high school that my kids go to, they had the girls state championship at Wansley Valley High School. But Matt's dream was to play college football at Ohio State. He had a lot of guts and a lot of determination. Starting in third grade, he said he was going to go to Ohio State, start as a sophomore at middle linebacker, Buckus Award. He told his teachers, he told his coaches, and he told his real friends. And I said, man, you're setting yourself up. These guys are going to harass you if you don't make it. He said, no, if they're my real friends, they'll be cheerleaders. Thanks for the Buckeye shirt. He worked every day to achieve his dream. He did little things. But he also did some stuff that maybe you haven't thought about. Whatever your dream is, look at what the people who are doing that and are successful what they're doing. Talk to them. Matt had actually interviewed coaches. What are they looking for? And all those coaches, they ask the same questions. What are your grades? What are you doing in your community outside of school to make your community better? And have you had any trouble with the law? They didn't ask him what kind of football player he was. Keep that in mind. Those are the same things you're going to see on some job applications. But unfortunately, Matt's dream to play college football was shattered. The slide says in less than two seconds we'd have to fix that. It was 2.7 to 3.3 seconds. Is that much time? Close your eyes, open them. Close your eyes, open them. Everything is gone. Everything. What did my son lose? Well, he lost a game he loved football. He started playing football in third grade and made really easy football. He was good. He was dedicated to that sport. The night he died, he was 5'10", 190 pounds at 15. The coroner said he was 3% body fat. He was all muscle. My wife and I, we missed that, watching our son compete. 
going out there and giving everything he had every play.
to let the two younger brothers tag along. But that particular night, Matt had turned to his younger brother, and he said, you know what, Joe, I haven't hung with this all day. I just want to spend some quality time alone and talk. Will you please not tag along? And that younger sibling actually listened to his older brother. And that is truly a blessing that Joe was not in the car that night. Then Matt turned around and did what many of you guys do. He comes tearing down the stairs, skipping every other step. I remember shouting out to him, Matt, slow down before you fall and hurt yourself. I don't even get those words out of my mouth, and I hear this thump because he's jogging to the bottom of the stairs. He comes jogging down the hallway, and he had this thing. He'd always love to slide across my kitchen floors. He comes sliding across my kitchen floors, and he's like, Mom, can I go assist to run this errand? I remember looking at him and saying, Matthew, are you crazy? Look at the laundry on the family room couch. It's your job to fold it, and you haven't touched it. And he's like, oh, no, Mom, I know, but please. I haven't hung with her all day. I just want to spend time with her. I promise you, I'll get to it as soon as I get back. Have you ever said that to your mom and dad? I promise you, let me just finish this. I'll get right on it. He had these big blue eyes, and I finally caved in, and I said, if you must spend time with your sister, then go ahead and go. I let him go that night. Well, my husband, he gets home from working out a while later. He's like, where are the children? I thought they would have beat me home. I said, Bob, but think about it. Chris is outgoing, very social person. They're probably at Delta Sonic. They ran into someone and they're talking. Or they decided to stop at 7-Eleven for Slurpees, DQ for Blizzard, especially since Joe's not with them. That's something they would do for their younger sibling. He said, yeah, you're right. I put his mind to ease a little bit. And then some more time goes by, and the phone rings. Mrs. Brand, yes. This is Rush Coffee Hospital. There's been a car accident. We have your children here. Are they okay? I can't tell you that. Well, how bad was the crash? I can't give you that information. I can only tell you that either you or your husband need to come to the hospital. You see, if anything like this happens to you, the hospital is not going to tell your parents over the phone what kind of condition you're in. The last thing they want to do is get a parent in a car that is upset behind the wheel. I got off the phone. My husband was standing next to me, so he heard what was going on. But Joe, the youngest one, was still upstairs playing in his bedroom. I went to the front of the house and called up to him, Joe, Matt and Chris have been in a car accident. Dad, they need to get to the hospital. That 11-year-old, fifth grader, had the most frightening look on his face. I have to be with you, Mom. He actually told me a couple of weeks later, he said, Mom, the night you called for me and told me about Matt Krista, I had a gut feeling I had just lost a brother or sister, and I knew I had to be with you. The three of us get in my minivan. I'm driving to the hospital. I'm literally clutching the steering wheel so tightly, the little droplets of sweat is coming off the palm of my hands, and I am praying nonstop the entire way to the hospital. Any of you ever been to emergency rooms before? Most of you have. And they usually take you back to the room, the bed, maybe a curtain is drawn. When we got to the hospital, we went through the double glass doors and we told them who we were. They didn't take us back to a room like that. In fact, we weren't taken back to see our children at all. Instead, we were taken back to a room with the couch and end tables and lamps. I remember taking one step in this room and I thought, this isn't good. They don't be in a place like this unless they have to have a serious heart-to-heart -heart talk with you. Well, it seemed like we were there for an hour, but finally a doctor arrives. Mr. and Mrs. Brandt just got done operating on your daughter. She's got a broken collarbone, six broken ribs. One of her lungs was punctured, means there's a hole in it, and it had collapsed. And they had put a shunt in the side of her and forced air in to keep her lung expanded so she could breathe said we watched her very closely for any swelling to the brain or brain trauma, but we think she's going to be okay. You see, during surgery, she responded well to us, and that's a very good sign. Man, we had no clue what those injuries meant, but we heard we think she's going to be okay, and we hung on to that. Then he said there was somebody else in the car, and we said, yes, that would be our son Matthew, Chris's younger brother. You see, they left between 7 and 7.30 at night. The crash happened at 8.30. Matt was already ready for bed. He had his lounge pants on that you guys wear. He had a tank top. 
He had no shoes, no socks, no flip-flops, no sweatshirt, no coat. I mean, let's be honest, how many of you wear a winter coat? Well, he didn't have his orders from him on. Doctor said, well, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but it appears your son died at the scene. Upon impact, his neck broke. And when his neck broke, it slit the main artery in your neck, your carotid artery, and he bled out. He said, I can't tell you. With that kind of injury, your son most likely died quickly and painlessly. Talk about life throwing you a curveball, feeling like you've just been thrust into a center of twister and everything's spinning out of control. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. In fact, it's been four and a half years, and I can tell you, every single day, I'm in awe that my feelings had to walk this journey, because nobody ever believes it can happen to them. And I had to step back, and I know my husband was the same way, and I had to look at the whole picture, and when I did, I thought, thank God, Joe, the youngest one, was not in the car. Thank God he believed Crystal will be okay, and thank God my son, Matt, did not endure pain and suffering in his death. Because I know as a mother, I could not have handled seeing my son endure pain and suffering. And something else we found out, paramedics tell us, they go, Mr. and Mrs. Grant, we don't think your children ever saw that they were about to get hit. Because when you're about to enter a car crash, usually there's a facial expression, right hand or arm goes up, and that didn't happen. Matt and Chris's body were very relaxed, looking straight ahead. And I thought, what a blessing, my son, because he did take the brunt of that crash, did not see that his life was going to be taken from him and be filled with fear moments before his death. And another blessing we got out that night is that we were advised by the coroner and some medical staff that <clears throat> the um, injuries that they saw there that evening, they said these are not normal. We know speed is a problem factor. And that gave us a heads up as far as legal reasons later. Well, what did happen? Imagine an intersection you go through every single day to get to and from your home. That's the kind of intersection that took my son's life. My children were less than a mile from home. All they had to do was turn go 100 feet and they'd be home. There was no cell phone. There was no radio being played. There was no CD in the CD player. The conversations between Matt and Chris had actually ceased when they got to the intersection. There were no distractions. She had a solid green light. She waited for traffic to clear. Once traffic cleared, she executed a left-hand turn. She was three-fourths of the way through the turn when our car was hit. Our car was hit by a smaller car, a car that weighed 1,500 pounds less. Doesn't matter when you have an element of speed. Upon impact, our car went airborne 15 feet. Sideways, came back down in front of her axis broke, went an additional 35 feet sideways until it finally ran into a third vehicle. And there's the headlights of the third vehicle. It was an SUV. That SUV was on the road that our children were turning onto. And that's a blessing, too, because it prevented the driver's side from hitting that pole and protected our daughter. I told you it was a blessing. Joe, the youngest, wasn't in the car. I know where that youngest child sat. He always sat in that center of her seat. But if you could look inside this window, this door panel was actually pushed to the center. Now, the driver did hit his brakes, had 15 feet of skid marks. And that's a blessing because that's one of the elements they need to mathematically calculate the speed. The speed of impact was between 74 and a half and 82 and a half miles an hour in a 45 mile hour zone. Let me repeat that. That's the speed at impact. That's the speed after the driver hit his brakes. They estimate he was going 90 miles an hour prior to hitting his brakes. And guess what? The driver was into street racing. So he had done something to his brakes. It's called drill him out. To give him the ability to stop at a faster rate, shorter distance. Didn't matter. Nobody's brakes work as well as they think they're going to work when they need him to work. Now, would you like to tell them what non cop said? My husband served in Desert Storm, and one of his comrades was an engineer from Ford. And so we gave him all the information about the crash. Said non cop the photos and the writer. Of course, like all of us, he looked at the photos first. And in his analysis, 
just from the photos, he said, what kind of SUV hit that Taurus and how fast was it going? So it wasn't an SUV, it was a Honda Civic. Because of the amount of damage in the cave-in. But the reason he thought it was an SUV is that beam that she's got the red little light on is the strongest part on the side of the Taurus. In fact, it is a steel beam. There's another picture that we don't show that shows that steel beam sheared, which means it's cut in two. He said there's no way their computer model has that happen. Then he went into the report and saw some of the changes and modifications the average driver had done to his car. So what he had done to his car is the back end was jacked up, the front end was pointed down, he had put in a bigger engine with more horsepower. With that bigger engine, then it needed a bigger suspension system. And then with that, then he had to have like additional plates in the front to support the additional weight. He had also altered his headlights. His headlights were pointed down and angled out. And when they're on, imagine just a blue ring, just a blue ring, black in the center. That's what the headlights would look at like. Now, I told you, 74 and a half to 82 and a half at impact, approximately 90 miles an hour. We said it was a 2.7 second turn. Well, let me tell you how far he traveled in 2.7 seconds. A football field, both end zones, 40 more feet. A football field, both end zones, 40 more feet. That's the physical distance he was. Now, because he had altered the car, they said that that would, if you saw that vehicle on the roadway, it give you the visual perception that the car is at least 40 more feet away. More than any other time to make a turn. Now, when we finally had access to the car, the seat that Matt said in Imagine the Book closed up. No wider than that. And I thought, how did my son fit in that seat? Well, several weeks after the crash, my husband set in on a coroner's inquest. It's an inquest where they hear testimonies to determine the manner of death to put on the death certificate. The coroner sat down next to my husband. And this is what she said. It was a nice young lady, a doctor. She got up to testify and used all kinds of big words for my son's injuries. And she came and sat next to me in the gallery. And she said, Mr. Brand, it's a blessing that your son's neck broke and he died quickly. I said, well, anybody has to die in any form, it's good if it's quick. Because I've seen people linger and seen people suffer. And she said, no, you don't understand. Your son's injuries were, a great many of them were internal. She said, in fact, because it was such a high velocity impact, all the bones on the right side of your son's body had shattered. They didn't break, they shattered. And the momentum of that impact caused those bones to traverse his body from right to left and lacerate his internal organs. She stated there was not a trauma team in the world, even if they'd been at the scene, that could have saved your son's life and he would have died a painful death. Then she went on to say there's three injuries that they see in high-speed crashes. The shattered bones, traumatic brain injury, and also crushed chest cavities. Now, my son did have a traumatic brain injury also, but the broken neck and the lacerated internal organs was what did it. So think about that. Momentum's traveling right to left. You have these small fragments of bones. They are coming across internally and they are cutting up heart, kidney, lungs, spleen. We wondered why nobody approached us to donate Matt's organs. He had on his permit that he would be an organ donor. We could not because of the internal injuries that he sustained. How else does speeding affect a crash? Reduces your reaction time. From the point that you see danger, your brain processes it, your body responds. Three quarters of one and a half seconds already ticked off the clock. How many seconds does it take you to look down and read a text message? Trick question. Depends on how long the text is. But I think two seconds is probably pretty conservative. You look down and read a text message. You look up, you've crossed the center line. Now add that two seconds to your reaction time. Yet two and three quarters, three and a half seconds. Your life. And your family's lives have 
has now been forever altered, or even another family's. Increases distance to stop, well that's just common sense. The faster you're going, the more distance you need to stop. Higher risk of severe injuries and deaths. All right, let me ask you this. If you're heading down the road going 65 miles an hour, how fast is the body inside you? 65 miles an hour. How fast are the brain and organs moving? 65 miles an hour. If you come to a sudden halt, what's your brain and organs still doing? They're still moving until they have their own separate impact. Now, the case that I would, uh, you guys have a, a poster somewhere around that says rules of the road. Look at the BMW in that because that BMW was going in the streets of Chicago at 65 miles an hour. He suffers from traumatic brain injury. There's varying degrees. It doesn't show up on an MRI. It doesn't show up on an X-ray. It comes out in behaviors. It affects your memory, your decision making, and your emotions. And a lot of times, it's not diagnosed till later on. Okay? When that man now, when he wakes up in the morning, he has a to-do list: brush teeth, comb hair, shave. If you would walk with him next to him in the hallway, you would hear himself give himself commands: left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Permanent disability, a momentary thrill, a lasting lifetime effect. Reduces your restraint systems, your airbags and seatbelts from working effectively. I am certain, well, let me see, give me a show of hands. How many of you have heard teens to get their cars up at a high rate of speed to jump a hill or jump a railroad track to go airborne? Have you guys known people or have heard of teens doing that? You guys are shy. All right. This happened, and this family is, gonna, is, is uh, joining us, and I'm hoping they'll be able to speak in a year. Their son was going between 70 and 100 miles an hour in a 25 mile hour zone. He hit the railroad tracks. His car went airborne, which is what he wanted, the thrill of going airborne. Guess what deployed when he, went, when he first hit those railroad tracks before he went airborne? His airbags. Do you think your airbags are meant to deploy and stay deployed? By the time he went 100 feet airborne and he came back down, his airbags had deflated. Now is the third common injury. We already gave you shattered bones, traumatic brain injury, frontal impact. Your chest is being forced into a steering wheel and a steering column and it's being crushed. If your chest is being crushed, your lungs are um, collapsing, and your brain is not getting oxygen it needs. And that's what happened to that young man. He died five months later from traumatic brain injury. He was in a coma and brain damage. Guys, we're not here to scare you, but I want you to truly understand the consequences that high speed can leave you. Every 10 miles over 50 doubles your risk of dying in a car crash. That's a physics problem, and I couldn't figure it out. So I talked to some engineers, and they explained it in very simple terms. <coughs> your colors are uh, red and black here. These two young men, this young man has a Ford Mustang. You look like a wild guy, let's make it a convertible. It's, it's bright red. This young man has a Ford Mustang. We'll have you in the world until you don't look as wide. There he's driving 25 miles an hour. They hit head on. That's a combined speed of, help me out. Good. 50 miles an hour. That impact, energy needs to be released, right? The energy that's released in that impact is equivalent to four sticks of dynamite exploding. Let's open a little bit. 30 and 30, combined speed of 60, same guy, same cars, hitting head on. That impact, the energy that needs to be released is equivalent to eight sticks of dynamite exploding. Pretty frightening, isn't it? Let's do it one more time. 35 miles an hour, each car is going. Combined speed of 70. That impact, anybody got an idea what that equivalent of dynamite is? Who said? 16? You're right. NASA's looking for guys like you, buddy. 
That is a physics question. 16 sticks of dynamite. How many of you would volunteer to let me wrap 16 sticks of dynamite around your waist and light it off? Anybody? No. The right, there's people in other countries looking for guys like you. Okay? But here, the rational person would not do that. Then why would you ever drive 70 miles an hour when there's cross traffic? Why would you drive 70 miles an hour? Think about that for a second. When there's cross traffic. Speeding does cost lives. More than a thousand Americans die every month due to speed-related crashes in the United States. If that were a disease, would we be looking for a cure? It's called an epidemic. Oh, in Illinois, we're real good at it. As a percentage, we're number five out of the 50 states. There are only 50 states, by the way. But here's one for you guys. Car crashes, all car crashes, are the leading cause of death for ages 3 to 33. Not only out of that age group, you guys are right in love. Please be smart. And I'll ask you a question I usually ask. We usually talk in driver's ed classes. What is the one class, and I gave you the hint, that you will use for the rest of your life? Guaranteed. Yes, sir. Driver's ed, you're a genius. Can you catch? I can't hold Good job. Guys, you're a little good at killing people. 38% of male drivers in a fatal crash that are between the ages of 15 and 20 were speed. Ladies, you're starting to catch up nationally. And speed is one of the three leading factors in teen fatal crashes. Can you guys control those numbers? Can you change those numbers? Who's controlling that? You guys. By your decisions behind you. Speeding costs money. I'm going to tell you a little bit about ours. It says $40.4 billion. That's from the Insurance Institute. In our crash, two cars were totaled. One was the SUV was damaged to the tune of $8,000. It's $47,000. My daughter's medical bills just for the hospital were $133,000. That doesn't include therapy and some of the other stuff she had to go through. There were two funerals. Oh, I didn't tell you. The adverse driver, he had a passenger. It was supposed to be it was his girlfriend. She died three days after the crash. She had a traumatic brain injury. Her brain kept swelling and it couldn't stop. In fact, they flew her from Rush Copley to Loyola and conducted emergency brain surgery. The guest of was $500,000 for her medical bills. So the two funerals, six to $12,000 each. Oh, I had to hire a lawyer for the first time in my life. So let me ask you something. Does $40.4 billion seem reasonable when our crash costs about one and a half billion? And there's a thousand of them going on every month? Pretty reasonable. There's four billion dollars that we're spending to cure cancer. How many families or people in here know somebody that's been affected by cancer? Almost all of us, right? Shouldn't we reverse those numbers? Shouldn't we spend $40 billion to cure cancer? and waste $40 billion in traffic, speed-related crashes. It would be a good idea, wouldn't it? It's up to us, every one of us that has a license, to make that happen. Speed shatters lives. Shattered my son's bones. What about my daughter, Crystal, 17? She woke up shortly after the crash. She looked over, saw people outside the car on cell phones called for emergency services. Yelled for her brother and turned her head. Matt didn't answer. Her last sight of her younger brother, her best buddy, was blood coming out of his ear and blood gushing out of his mouth. Do you think that sight, that picture, ever leaves her brain? No. She had to go through therapy and we had to go through counseling. And it's been a tough time for her. She was diagnosed with traumatic, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Now, you guys hear that on the TV every once in a while for the guys coming back from the war. But guess what? You can have it for one event right here in the States. She was also diagnosed with survivor's guilt. Some of the stuff that came out of her mouth. Mom and Dad, why did I live in that time? Mom and Dad, I've been thinking about it. If you guys hate me, I understand. Because I was driving and I didn't have to die. Now, do you think my daughter goes to bed one night and wakes up the next morning and everything's honky dory? She isn't that yet. It's been four and a half years. She isn't that yet to the personality that she had prior to the crash. In fact, just recently, because she had a little girl, she had a baby girl, we started to see glimpses of the Krista that we used to have. It's going to be a lifetime journey for her and us. You don't want to do that to somebody else. You don't want to have to do it to your family. Hopes and goals were shared on March 11. You know what? We come out to do this because we want you guys to succeed in life. We want you to reach your hopes, your goals, whatever they are. Dreams were shared on March 11, 2004. We will never, ever see our son succeed and reach his dreams. But our prayer is that we have touched you where if you don't have a dream, you'll get one. And you'll do something, no matter how small it is, every single day to keep your dream alive and in front of you. You know, small things have significant impacts in life. The small thing of wearing your seatbelt correctly. The small task of not being distracted by a two-second uh, text message. And in our case, what they said was, if the average driver had been going one mile an hour or less, is that much? One mile an hour or less? Absolutely not. But if he had, it would have been enough that there never would have been an impact. And our son, our Matthew, would be with us today. Do not discount small things in life that can have significant impacts in your successes as well as things that can result in tragedy. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd just like to thank the Brands for coming out today and presenting to us uh, about the dangers of speeding. Uh, second off, I have a couple of announcements before we dismiss back to the first period. Um, you guys will have the opportunity to win a prize from the GCMS License to Live team. Uh, you can do this by turning in a short time five prize winners that will be able to participate in the Driving Skills for Life on Thursday, October 9th from 8.30 to noon. Uh, Gabe Gardner, Kate Schmidt, Nathan Young, Kayla Dunahy, Stephen Massey, Kiefer Kramer, Jessica Swearingen, Anna Coates, Sydney Overman, Brandon Clark, Tina Kirchner, Mackenzie Seneca, Nick Bodie, Crystal Johnson, Tyler Smith. If you have any questions, you can just see uh, Mrs. Jones or I about that. Thank you. Okay, on your way out, if we have the GCMS license to live people in and out, uh, the essay contest things on the way out. You can get to the doorways. Make sure you pick one up on your way out. Again, thank you everybody. Let's keep this a safe homecoming. And uh, Jared Hopkins on to another victory.